to tell you about what happened in the classroom, in the Wi-Fi free war zone where banter is a bully's best bullet and battle cry jibes bounce off tripping tongues and your best bet is bite back or be broken by cheap shots and belittling and badly built word bombs. Boom, and you're beaten. Can I tell you what happened in the classroom? In the post-break time zoo where little monkeys are suddenly free from their cages, ripping up pages we printed and swinging from tales of too much sugar and not enough attention. Where best mate primates become incubated, irritated inmates. Where we are suddenly keepers of the worst kind of secret. So can I tell you what happened? Around the table, a dozen doubters gathered. Student soldiers studded with swear word scars and packs of creatures wild enough to rip your smile off and swallow it whole. We lured them in, wound nooses of words round their necks, alphabeted traps for them to fall into unaware, drew rope ladder metaphors in the trenches for them to climb out until they were ours. And then it happened. They sang tuneless songs in slang for us. They listened to each other because their stories were worth listening to. They let images fall into their laps and lap them up, drinking poetry like Lucasaid, buzzing off the energy of what they had created. Then the bell went. The call to battle, feeding time at the zoo, and the soldiers rose from their chairs. The chimps grabbed their bags and scampered off into the corridors, and teeth were bared and bullets flew. But I was there. I saw it. It happened. The best kind of secret is the kind that is kept in the bottom of school bags, in the scrape of plastic chairs and in the voices of students who, despite what they say, kind of, sort of, care. My name is Sarah, and I'm a poet and a spoken word educator. And until I handed my dissertation in this morning, a master's student. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And before I was a poet, I was an actor. And before I was an actor, I was training here to be an actor. And before that, I was a secondary school student. And when I was at school, something really, really bad happened to my family. When I was 12, my father died. Now, that's a statement I've got really good at saying, but when I was younger, that sentence would catch in my throat, stick its arms out and adamantly refuse to come out. I found it really, really difficult to talk to anyone about what had happened. On the day he died, I wrote a poem about it because I was that kind of kid. It was a really terrible poem, but it was slightly easier to say than what I was feeling. Which brings me to what I am now, which is a full-time poet. Also a sentence I never thought I'd be able to say. Poetry allows me to take control of my experience and repurpose it in a creative way, to distance myself from it. As soon as you introduce rhyme or rhythm or character to a difficult experience, it's harder to feel like it's something that happened to you and easier to see objectively, like a story. And I don't know about you, but I find stories a lot easier to tell than the truth. Poetry allows me to be the most articulate version of myself, often about the things that are otherwise too hard to talk about. Now, a big part of being a poet, for me, is facilitating other people in telling their stories. I've just finished a two-year placement as spoken word educator at Lamas School in Leighton, East London. Now, this particular school has high numbers of students for whom English is an additional language. Many of them have just arrived in the UK with harrowing stories of fleeing war-torn countries caught in their throats, and a huge percentage of the pupils are classified as underprivileged. As I'm sure you're aware, schools across the country are sinking from similar burdens, and government life jackets are few and far between. These are the kind of schools that really need work like this, and the kind of schools that are finding it harder and harder to afford it. So what did my role look like? Well, essentially, by working two days a week as a permanent creative force within the English department, I bridged the gap between visiting poet and teacher. I worked alongside the curriculum to encourage confidence, creativity, and communication through poetry workshops, one-on-one -on -one support, projects, and poetry slams. I also led the GCSE Unseen Poetry Unit for Year 11 and nurtured a school-wide culture of spoken word. Now, getting kids to write their feelings down is nothing new. It's therapeutic, we know that. But writing something down and saying something out loud are two completely different things. And as much as I love writing, I don't actually approach this work as a writer. I like to think of myself more like a trained actor with a terrible writing habit. 
The theatre practitioner Jacques Lecoq admits that he came to theatre by way of sport. The geometry of the parallel bars at his local gym and the movement of the body through space transported him from one form of expression to another. In turn, I come to poetry by way of theatre. When I approach a poem, I do so in the same way that I'd go about creating a play or tackling a monologue. In simple terms, I want to find a truthful and interesting way to express my intention. I want to use language economically to its full potential. I want to entertain, and I am, at all times, completely aware of the audience. I've labelled my approach as a pedagogy of performance, where equal value is placed on both the written and the spoken word. Because just speaking with no parameters, just improvising, can be scary sometimes. It certainly was for me. Whereas taking the time to construct something meaningful and then the act of reading it out can, for some people, be extraordinarily liberating. And the results are transformative. Take the two softly spoken 13-year-old Muslim girls who stood up in front of their male-dominated class and performed powerful poems about feminism. Or the boy at the Year 7 Slam who spoke out about bullying with his perpetrators in the audience to an entire year group applauding his bravery. Or the 15-year-old refugee who travelled from Syria to London on his own and was desperate for a safe space to simply share his story. I could go on and on about all the humbling moments, but I thought it was better to let some of the students speak for themselves. This is a poem written by a group of Year 9 students uh, in a workshop, all of whom have English as an additional language, and it was written about a fellow classmate who is illiterate even in his own language. It's based on the shape of his name in Pashto script. My name is a nervous tornado destroying the city of Kabul. My name is a tired grey jeep driving from Afghanistan to London. My name is the Khalifa Tower in Dubai. Too rich, a beautiful triangle in the ocean of sky. My name is a happy smile stretching across London tower blocks. My name is a question mark. Honestly, I wish I could show you the size of his smile when he realized we'd constructed something that celebrated his culture and identity. This is one of a handful of poems that was published alongside mine, written by a student uh, in my newest collection, Louder Than Words. Seeing their words in print gave these students a sense of achievement that they just don't normally get, especially if they're struggling academically. It gave them a chance to see what's possible, that their voices are important and that their stories are valid. Sadly, the current system doesn't cater for everyone. Creativity is being weeded out of the curriculum, and there is a crippling emphasis being placed on grades and numbers, and no alternative being offered for those who don't necessarily excel at traditionally academic subjects. In an ideal world, there would be a poet or creative force within every school, there specifically to help young people express themselves and develop transferable skills that they wouldn't otherwise access. The current model is not representative of the real world, where you simply won't succeed at a job interview without the skills to talk about yourself and your experience. It favours those whose parents are able to help them with presentation and communication skills outside of school. It is elitist, and it shouldn't be. Spoken word isn't for everyone, but it's often for those who don't expect it to be. Sometimes simply giving a kid a chance to be heard is enough to unlock whatever was making them a disruptive force in the classroom. And it also gives teachers an insight into the kids they teach that they just don't get from essay answers. This is what they teach me. Today I learned that the boy with the untucked shirt feels more than he lets on. All he told me is that home is a basketball court. All he said is that he gets bounced around one too many times. All he admitted is that the crowd doesn't support the team. They cheer for themselves, too loudly it seems. Today I learned that the girl at the back of the class is struggling. All she told me is that she is dirt, walked all over. She dug her eyes deep into the earth when she told me this. It didn't muddy her sentiment, she is sediment, sowing her seeds, waiting to grow out of all of this. Out in the corridor, Toby becomes a pressure cooker right at my feet. It takes four teachers, untrained in this, to become a straitjacket. Today, I learned that in this sometimes classroom, sometimes waiting room, there is a table of children whose family are airmail postage stamps, and they have forgotten the address, or maybe just the language it is written in. 
Just beyond the door, the only way Toby can explain why he is the way he is is by turning his tonsils into razor blades and his feet into catapults. All that he told us is that his hurt is so deep, we should not try to help in case we fall in too. All that he showed us is that the floor will not discriminate between stumps of feet and those of heads. All that he meant remains encrypted in his kicks. The kid who sits on her own tells me the clouds are an army waiting to attack. Most imagine marshmallows. I remember all too well what it felt like when it was always just about to rain. I believe the current curriculum is ill-equipped to deal with this generation and the specific issues and tensions they're faced with, like Trump or Brexit or the refugee crisis, which I'm sure is far more real in an East London classroom than it is in Westminster. This work helps to productively absorb the tra trauma of it all and, with its inherently political undertones, gives them the tools to protest and not to brag or anything, but spoken word is cool. Like, it's in touch with current trends, and until they stop teaching poetry by dead white guys in the syllabus, this work is bringing 2017 into the classroom. Kids love rap, and they connect way more with the idea of creating lyrics or slam poems than they do with writing flowery poetry, as it's often perceived. This teaches them without teaching them, developing skills in literacy, rhetoric, and even textual analysis without them even knowing. And it gives them a positive role model with a career in the arts, giving them hope that if they're not academic, it's still more than possible for them to forge a successful path for themselves. Alternative approaches to education are needed now more than ever. The current system is failing the most vulnerable in our society instead of celebrating their resilience, individuality, and imaginations. And trust me, these kids have that in abundance. This work encourages young people to take agency over their experiences. It shows teachers that there are creative geniuses in their classrooms that they haven't noticed because maybe their handwriting is terrible. Spoken word education gives a voice to the voiceless. I'd like to end this talk in the same way that I began, with a poem. This is a poem that I often deliver at the beginning of a workshop or class. I don't believe in getting young people do, to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself. By showing them I can be vulnerable, I give them permission to do the same. This poem is called Present. I keep my father in the folds of his knitwear. I keep November in the neckline and his surname in the color. You cannot get a darker green and still call it green. I remember when I'd watched my mother sew his name into my school uniform. Head bent in concentration, patience threaded into her focus, the likes of which I wouldn't know for years. I wore his name with pride, carved it cursively onto exercise books, answered to it in the register, always thankful to be near the front, never waiting like the Woods or the Thompsons for my turn to come around. It went Atkinson, Bagri, Broido, Curl, Delaney, Defratus, Green. Present, I would call into the classroom. Sometimes we would joke, shout things like Christmas tree or Rudolph, not understanding that the game was not to name festive things. That present meant here, that we existed, that we were proof of us. Introductions went Sara no H, green no E, just like the color. His name would sit on my tongue, heavy like extravagant family dinners and Christmas when everyone was present. Now it lies printed on my bank card like a secret. It is passports and pay slips. The other me is self-employed. I only use it when I have to, like tax avoidance of a past that no longer fits. Each November, I pull my father out from his drawer, dust off another year without him, and pull his name over my head. Sometimes his jumper is a hug. Sometimes it is strength, and sometimes just a vintage item for people to blindly compliment, unaware that it is not an attempt at fashion. I tell them it was a present that it belonged to someone else before me, that it is proof that he was. I wear him through the month he stopped existing like armor, like a shroud, like evidence. His jumper is my mood that month. You cannot get a darker green and still call it green. I wear him as we approach another Christmas without his presence, to ward it off, like Scrooge, like Grinch. I steal back the years. I steal back my name. I wear it for a while. Try it on for size. Feels like my mum has sewn me into it, and with her patience, I make it through the month. Then he goes back in his drawer, neatly folded, waiting like the woods 
for his name to be called. I keep him waiting. I keep him in the folds of his knitwear. I keep November in the neckline and his surname in the color. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks.